Shall we start, sir? It's five minutes. Please. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, virtual session on managing family business in uncertain times. Uh, this uh, session is being co-hosted by uh, I IIFL Wealth. Um, before we start, I request uh, Mr. M S A Kumar, immediate past president of uh, Thai Kerala, uh, to anchor the session as well as uh, you know take the proceedings further. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, Ram. Good evening, friends. Uh, I think it's really. Uncertain times. I see, uh, for example, Johnny Paul. I was just seeing him after a month. Uh, if I had seen him on the road, I wouldn't even recognize him. So, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, well, we are we are in uncertain times. Uh, we are in uh, challenging times as well. Uh, so, we have this uh, family business webinar series uh, starting today. Uh, and uh, who else to address this uh, other than? Uh, the authority in family business, uh, both in India and globally, was a Kavil Ramayandran from Indian School of Business. Uh, I was not very sure whether he needs an introduction because when we announced this uh, webinar, uh, we have so far 240 uh, registrations and I see only 141 has checked in, uh, logged in for this particular uh, webinar. Uh, before I hand over to Professor Kavil Ramachandran and introduce him formally, uh, let me profusely thank uh, Mr. Deepak Burgess, uh, Principal IIFL Wealth Management Kerala. Uh, he also has uh, moved in last year to take charge of IIFL in Kerala. So thanks, uh, Deepak, and uh, I would request you to tell a few words about uh, IIFL in the next five minutes before I again introduce uh, Ram and then go get going with the webinar. Over to Deepak. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This event is taking place in the midst of one of the most uncertain times in our history, as you know. Kerala has become a role model for the world to emulate how to fight crisis against all odds. We at IFL Wealth are extremely pleased to be associated with the Thai Kerala chapter for this evening's event. Let me begin by expressing our sincere thanks to Thai office bearers and the members for giving us the privilege to briefly share our thoughts with the distinguished audience. Uncertain times, the last time we heard the world talk in unison was in 2008. And that is when IFL was born during that crisis. But being in the industry for those many years, we could see an interesting shift in the way financial service and wealth management industry was shaping up. We believe wealth management should be the main offering and not just a strategic adjunct as in banks. We saw regulations changing. We could see our client expectations changing. And the whole business was moving away from being a pure distribution of financial products, which it was until 2008 to advisory focus. Um, the, the topic for today is again managing family business and our process and our daily lives is involved in managing families, business and investments through steady times and uncertain times. For the past 12 years, IFL Wealth has transformed into the fastest growing wealth and asset management company in the country. From inception, we have maintained the principles of simplicity, modesty and client centricity. We listed on the stock exchanges in September last year. As a firm, we are entrepreneurial, agile, and have redefined client engagement. We have always put people first, and the leaders here will all agree, we're as good as our team. Our employees own around 20% of the company, ensuring the mutual success of our clients and employees. Today, we are investment and financial advisors to more than 5,600 influential families in the HNI and UHNI space in India and abroad with assets of more than USD $24 billion. IFL Wealth is one of the pioneers in the industry to bring about product innovations and customized solutions. We are headquartered in Mumbai with more than 900 employees and have presence in six major global financial hubs in 23 locations in India. As a firm, we entered Kerala last year and set up our office in Cochin. It is very encouraging to see around us families, corporates, startups, HNIs, NRIs, all talking about advisory based processes in managing their finances and investment, and also engaging on broader solutions like estate planning and family governance. Knowing how to manage family business under different scenarios is the need of the hour. We have seen age old business facing trouble and going down to a combination of going down to due to a combination of factors. It is organizations like Thai, which are doing a great service for entrepreneurs and corporate leaders by hosting topical sessions like this. I'm certain 
professor kavil Ram ramachandran an academic luminary will throw more light on this topic once again thank you for having us here wish you a great session and look forward to catching up later stay safe sir thank you mr kumar yeah thanks deepak uh, for the very short and crisp introduction about iafl we value your support and we continue we would hope to see you in more forums like this uh, professor kavil ramachandran as i told you uh, he of course is a, is a malu uh, he is from the state of kerala and uh, he is very well known here uh, he hails from a small village called tayur which is uh, very near to trichur some 15 20 kilometers out and uh, of course we all call him ram whether it is his students uh, or disciples like me or, or or we don't call him professor kavil ramachandran he, he tells always even his uh, isb students hey, ram and instantly there are quite a lot of students who have uh, registered in this uh, webinar uh, so uh, ram again a very warm welcome a uh, few words about ram uh, literally speaking ram doesn't need an introduction to uh, this august audience uh, but let me tell you he basically started uh, in nowhere other than our own college in calicut devagiri college as a professor of uh, accountancy professor in accountancy and uh, economics and then moved on to iim ahmedabad uh, as as a professor in Uh, strategy and entrepreneurship from 86 to 2001 uh, i didn't have the fortune of being his student because i passed out from iim ahmedabad in 1976 uh, 10 years after that uh, ram was there in our uh, our old iim campus he was one of the founding faculty members of uh, indian school of business and he he leads the family business center there uh, i have attended many of his programs uh, when i started doing my own family business practice i have invited him for tai meetings cii meetings and he he is not a stranger so with this few words uh, ram i will hand over to you and uh, the format what we have is that uh, we have this uh, q and a uh, small icon at the at the very bottom please keep feeding your questions i i would like to make this as interactive as possible uh, because today we have uh, i just now looked at the score card we are 217 people logged in 217 uh, we had about 252 people registering normally the registration versus login ratio is about 70 75% i am not surprised that the ratio has gone up with uh, uh, illuminary like ram being the uh, speaker at the webinar so uh, please post your questions uh, i will look at the questions and then try to involve ram on a on a interactive session which will be definitely more valuable uh, so please Keep on posting, and now uh, without much ado, uh, over to Ram. Thank you, Kumar, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me so. Can you see this the screen? Not Ram. Um, I uh, I think uh, you can start sharing. To start sharing. I need to start sharing. Yes, sir. Again. Yeah. One second. Yeah. Good evening to everybody uh, from the safe and secure campus of uh, ISB in Hyderabad. Uh, I hope all of you are keeping well, taking care of yourself and the family. Everyone uh, is fine. so please do take care of yourself uh, it's, it's it's uncertain uh, unkind kind of time so we don't know how long it is going to continue in what form what shape so it's very important for all of us to take care of ourselves take care of the family take care of all the uh, stakeholders so i'm very very happy to uh, to come back and share some of my thoughts with you i know that there are quite a few of you who are whom with whom i have had the opportunity to interact to learn from you uh, some of my students some of my part program participants and friends so it's really uh, more like a family get together for me okay let me uh, start by uh, saying that uh, we have been hearing a lot of uh, uh, wisdom several people have been prescribing 
Several people have been saying that this is what going to happen. The world is going to be like this. And there are multiple scenarios built by various people. And they have said that these are the things people have to do. Okay. So I don't believe that it is possible. I don't believe that anybody has any idea about what's going to happen, what the world is likely to be, whether it's going to be the same, how different it is going to be. Nobody has any uh, idea. So I'm just adding a couple of cents, a couple of essay worth of uh, my own thoughts in this regard. Uh, one basic thing that is required is to build multiple scenarios. Instead of saying that this is going to be the scenario. And it's very difficult to assign that this is in the conventional scenario building exercise. We say that this is the best scenario, both scenario, probable scenario. So I think it's going to be many more scenarios. And one can uh, use the, the PESTEL uh, framework. PESTEL stands for uh, political, economic, social, uh, technological, environmental, and legal or regulatory uh, components of the environment. Uh, I mean, those who are not familiar with it can look up the Google and get uh, how to do a scenario building exercise using this. So the major benefit of it is that you are familiar with, you are, you are conscious of the impact of the various components of the environment. It's not just technology. And many of these components are interconnected. So create those uh, uh, technology, uh, uh, the scenarios, because, I mean, we, uh, we know that the, te uh, the disruptive technology started a couple of years back and 2019 was a time when many people started talking a lot about the disruptive technologies, uh, moving from uh, the conventional mechanisms to OTT and other platforms and variety of these. So the COVID has accelerated that. So let's understand that it is going to be more uncertain in those kinds of environments. Okay, one basic thing is that conserve cash as much as possible. Don't block your capital at all, if, if possible. Unless you are very, very clear that this is going to reward immediately. So be very conscious about utilization of cash. Okay, and I have uh, used this conventional ABC uh, analysis, ABC principle, which was developed in the context of materials management. But over the years, I have seen that it applies in the context of customers. One can categorize customers into ABC. Uh, in terms of products and uh, services, it is possible. Suppliers, it is possible. Our own staff, it is possible. All kinds of relationships, it is possible to categorize them depending on the criteria you apply. So once it is done, so the major thing that I'm trying to emphasize is that use this log, sorry, lockdown period to do the homework, do the exercise, because be prepared for uh, the major action once the lockdown is up or once the, the act activities start happening. And still it is going to be a lot of turbulent uh, scenarios. Maybe a lot of tsunamis will come. So probably re-strategizing will be required. I'm not using a big word. See what kind of product, what kind of customers, where products or services we want to focus. That has to be done carefully. Whether we want to continue with our existing portfolio, continue with the existing customers or not, whether there are new opportunities coming or not, it has to be reworked. Okay, and it's going to be work in process. And let's assume, let's believe that every crisis has, gives an opportunity. Let's avoid the impact of the crisis and move on to the opportunity. Be flexible about that. So I have developed a uh, framework called the uh, uh, discontent criticality analysis that's based on my uh, conviction or research finding that most entrepreneurial opportunities emerge where there are customer dissatisfaction uh, existing. Uh, customer dissatisfaction is the source of an opportunity. So, and I use a framework uh, uh, like this two by, I mean, uh, uh, two by two max. Uh, on the horizontal axis, I use the criticality of the need and the discontent of 
of the customers on the vertical axis. So if you look at uh, most of the products and services that are doing well, this research was based on my, um, my analysis of a variety of very successful companies of the 80s. And then I continued in the 90s, 2000s, and even now. If you look at, for instance, we are using Zoom. How many of us knew about Zoom as a powerful, important vehicle till now? I didn't, personally. I knew about it very, very vaguely, but only now I'm familiar with it. So that's because the criticality of the need has grown so big and the discontent with the other options is also very high. So where you have the discontent criticality high, this quadrant, that's where the opportunity is going to be. That's where the pull is going to come from the customers. So look at all the customers, look at all the services that you have or that you can offer, and then see how much of it is high discontent, high criticality. So try to do that. So that I find very, very important, very useful mechanism. But let me again emphasize that nobody knows anything. This is what William Goldman, the famous uh, uh, film personality writer, uh, told after looking at the success of many box office hits in Hollywood. He found that many of the scripts, many of the stories were rejected by very big film houses before they became very successful. So the conclusion is that nobody knows him, especially in this kinds of situation. So what do you do? How do you decide what is best? Then the best itself is unknown and unpredictable. So the, my approach to this is that learn from the, the fighting scene. This is a photo from a martial arts scene from Kerala's uh, Kalari Pait. And if you look at it, no fighter knows the enemy exactly what tricks the enemy is, is going to use, how much of capabilities the enemy has. But if you want to win in this kind of a situation, some of the capabilities required are this. We need to have the confidence. Don't lose confidence at all. Versatility is important. Anticipation of what the movement, what the move is going to be of your competitor, of your potential customers. So it's in a fluid environment. It is going to be very important to keep the presence of mind. Speed of response is, is going to be important. Flexibility is very important. We need to have quick reflex. In uh, Malayalam, uh, there is this, uh, in the Clary context, there is something called the Meya Kannauna. Means that the body should have be like an eye. You should be able to see around without looking around. So that kind of reflex is required. Agility is very important. Have an open mind to learning, changing. Don't say that this is the only thing that will work. So if we build these skills and then the capabilities, I believe that that is what is required to be done in this kind of situation so that when the fight starts, when the market opens, we are ready for that. Okay, so if you look at the, the resource basket, I call that the family business has there. What we call that the resource basket, combined the basket of combined resources of the family as well as the business. Okay, take stock, may list down. What are the unique, what are the critical resources we have? What kind of unique skills we have? What kind of network, network opportunities are there? Can we uh, reactivate some of the networks? What is the quality of our reputation? What kind of process capabilities are? How do we take decisions? What are the organizational systems and processes, family level processes existing, especially in terms of implementation? Then refine them, build further so that we are ready to respond to emerging challenges and opportunities anytime. And I think that requires a lot of thinking. We have to be disciplined every day, decide that we are going to spend at least two to three hours reflecting over this. So it's more like an exercise, like the martial art, uh, a martial artist who is getting ready for the, the fight any moment. Okay, let me now talk about the three circle model or even two circle model in family business. We thought that uh, this is a conventional three circle model. For the, especially for small and medium companies, the ownership and family will be overlapped. 
So it may be two circles. If it is slightly bigger, the ownership will be different. But then there are seven different stakeholders in this, but not all of them are equal and they don't assert themselves always in the same way. If you look at it, especially in crisis situation, all these stakeholders are likely to respond positively, negatively, very, very well, vocally. Some of them may be very quiet, some of them may be expecting many things, may like to be communicated, may like to be involved in decisions. So it's important to understand that there are different stakeholders in family business. It's not just the individual who is running the family business. There are multiple stakeholders because your decisions have implications, impact on everybody. So what do you do? Understand the uniqueness of family business. Some of the unique factors are, one is that in family business, people who are involved in the business, believe that everyone is an expert. It's not only that, we have a definite view. And above that, they think that that view is the best view and that will work always. And I've seen that in many families, the decision making is defined, driven by opinions, not objective approaches. So this is something unique about families and which it, it should be curtailed, it should be curtailed. Okay. And also everyone, especially people who are involved in the business may, will have shares. In many cases, it will be equal shareholding. So they believe that they have the equal right, right to be heard, right to be involved in decision, right to be involved in implementation. <clears throat> Yet another thing is that in the, especially in our kind of socio-cultural context, seniors are the voice of people, smarter people. More experience means smartness. It doesn't matter whether the technology is changing with the younger generation members know more or better or not better informed or not, but still the hierarchy uh, is very important. So if there is discussion, if uh, somebody wants to defer with the view of a senior, it's not very easy in the family business context to discussion. And yet another thing is that we value our relationship. We don't want to hurt anybody or to upset anybody. So this is the kind of unique situation in which family businesses are. And therefore, it's very important to understand that there are different views existing within the family. Let me share with you a research finding that I had. I did a survey among my students and their parents. <clears throat> so this is the normal time. If you look at it, look at the difference. One is that seniors also do not think that they have a shared vision, not all of them. Shared growth aspirations, and it's only three fourths approximately. Communication quality is only not even two thirds. Trust in other family members' intentions, not so high. And when you look at the younger generation members, it is much, much less. Especially look at the frank communication, it's only, 46% versus 62%. That's a huge area, very important area to look at. And there is no clear policy. We don't develop policies for entry of next generation members. Retirement, everyone is, uh, both the youngsters as well as the seniors, we don't have a retirement plan at all. That's as simple as that. Uh, starting new ventures within the family or not, no policies. So this is only tip of the iceberg, which means that most families don't have mechanisms to discuss in any structured way the situations, the challenges they are facing or to move forward. So under this kind of circumstance, especially when there is crisis, what should the families do? My thinking, my conviction is to develop and refine the rules of the game. Who will do what? how and when. I think that's very important. <clears throat> okay, so if we want to align the families continuously, so we have to start aligning them now and then ensure that the alignment is retained on a continuous basis. Some of the areas of importance. Is the leadership effective? Is the leadership appropriate for the emerging situation? Is the current leader the most capable person to handle this kind of a turbulent situation? Or should the leadership be supplemented, both at the family as well as the business side? 
Are we, are we very clear about the ownership and inheritance policies? Are these fair? If these are not fair, these should be addressed. And I would say that this lockdown situation, when most of the family members are at home, you make use of this time to open up, have discussion on this, and see what best can be addressed, what can be done. Okay. Then yet another area of critical importance is the family's multiple roles. Who are the people involved? And what will they do? How will they be involved? Is it about the operations? Is it about the strategy? Is it about starting something new? Is it about expanding some existing businesses or looking at the new opportunities? Think about it. Spend, allocate to the responsibilities within the families. And this is also yet another important thing is that opportunities may appear in the horizon. Suddenly, new opportunities will come. Business strategy is in crisis. So what are the options and what are the decisions? Who are the people who are going to be involved in the decisions? This is particularly important, even if the strategy remains the same, operations-wise, what, what are our operational capabilities? Are we good at that? Are we happy with that? Review that. And what kind of changes are required? Maybe operating styles, maybe operating decision-making. There needs to be changes. Okay. <clears throat> Why I'm saying is, saying this is because in my long years of experience of interacting with families, especially medium, small family, family business, is that most of them lack clear policies. Even families that write constitution, they have some of the policies and processes they don't practice. And that is very, very difficult. And unless we spend time, work at it, that practice will not happen, okay? So if families do not have policies or do not practice it, that's when they get into sort of a gridlock situation. And my, again, conviction is that when it comes to the second and third generation, most families do not survive as one entity. And this is primarily because they get into a gridlock situation. It is possible to anticipate the gridlock and this kind of situation, this kind of lockdown, is the, uh, is the right time, is the best time to start thinking about it, how to prevent gridlock, how to address challenges, both on the family as well as the, as well as the business. So, so what are my thoughts in terms of the process? Develop process clarity in decision-making. Let me elaborate this. What do I mean by that? Okay. So in many of the, uh, in the business context, those who have gone through business uh, training, business management training would know that typical case method approach is that you decide your goal. Problem solving approach is that you decide your goal, what are the criteria you are going to apply and what are the options you have in terms of solving the, uh, the problem. Evaluate each of the uh, uh, options against the criteria and then arrive at the decision and then agree on the implementation format. This is the structure. This happens below the family level. Most often at the family level and above, family members who are involved in operations. This principle is not very often applied. Family members apply the opinions, their own viewpoint. They say and push from that angle. Okay, what I know is the right thing. So therefore, bring this clarity of logical decision making into the, into the problem solving context. And I use, uh, besides this, I use what I call the weighted average scoring method. So the criteria are not equally important. Give weightage to each of the criteria and then find the weighted average for each of the options. And there is a method possible for that. For want of time, I'm not going to get into that. But I find that you, you may arrive at a number, a score for each of the option. And then everyone is aware of the process followed and why and how we arrived at one of the options. And then you can, again, when the scenario changes, when the options change, when the criteria have to be changed, it is very easy if it is done on an Excel sheet. Similarly, yet another decide on the decision-making structure. 
is it a family business board if it is of the members of the family or is it going to be an independent set of people or some members of the family or not so be clear as to the people who are going to be involved in the decision and what will be the process have an agenda for any of the meetings have uh, decisions made have minutes prepared have action taken report reviewed okay so for this for decision making i would recommend use of what i have developed as an iad framework information advice decision and execution let me just show it to you how it works here a decision area can be purchase of an equipment recruiting manager or anything or even appointing dealer or choosing a customer or anything and then you decide who are the people who will be involved in the decision whether it is one individual or two individuals or more number of people and what is the process for that who are the people who are going to be involved in the execution from the family side and again who are the people who are going to be connected whose views are very important who are knowledgeable but not involved in decision so write down the advice but their view need not be binding on the people who are taking the decision similarly the rest of the family or some of the family members need to be informed so be clear as to the, the roles of families under each of these decision areas if this is done then a lot of the challenges can be addressed and this is not a static uh, 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 agreement this is dynamic we can revisit it and change it as we go along and one can get into the sub points purchase equipment will have multiple steps so decide on those things also so that clarifies the role of family members in the business and then practice family governance major thing is code of conduct very often when people write down the code of conduct they don't look at the practice part it's easy to write down the code of conduct and if you look up the net you find the best of the ideal code of conduct but start practicing and find out why some of these things are difficult to practice or easy to practice okay review that and then create the family governance family governance means the creating policies and processes policies for the involvement of family members in the business reward system career planning uh, then maybe the ownership part of it retirement part of it families reward, families involvement in decision making so policies about many of these things will have to be prepared and then how these decisions are going to be made how these are implemented again reflect on the practice of it i have found what i call the whiteboard strategy very effective that what i'm saying is that most often discussions take place either at the dining table or in the office or around the table sometimes so all the family members are there, or all the stakeholders are there, or all the people who are to be who ought to be involved in the decision out there but not always and sometimes some of the family members may say that i didn't know about it i was not involved i could have given a better solution or they could have provided a better solution so therefore i suggest having a whiteboard if you have a whiteboard in your office room meeting room in the office at uh, at home write down this use the multiple criteria method criteria option evaluation mechanism write down the points that you are discussed leave it there take snaps of it images of it so that that goes into the record and if the decision is not discussion is not complete hold on to that leave it there you can come back so it will be there as a is uh, as uh, evidence as well as also for the next round of discussion to start yet another point family dining room dining table is for dining relaxation family to enjoy not for business discussion exchanging some ideas may be right may be okay but very often exchanging ideas lead to discussion discussion could lead to differences and very often fights so avoid the discussion at the dining table 
if there are issues coming up, if there are interesting topics coming up, write them down, move to a separate room, move to the room where you have an office, have the discussion there, or even the drawing room is okay, if you can convert it into an office uh, discussion. So separate dining room from this, okay. And again, watch out for drop in communication quality. It drops slightly, gradually. People don't notice it. If people are not opening up, people are keeping quiet, persuade them, encourage them to come out. Okay. So some of the, the steps to improve the practice of uh, processes is that discuss the code of conduct and values at every family meeting. In the beginning, go over that. And that's a reminder. It's more like a family prayer. If you have a prayer, pray, start with that, and then continue. And follow the agenda, keep minutes. And I found 360 degree feedback of all the family members, especially people who are involved in the business, is very effective. And counsel individually. Okay. Reflect on what worked and what did not work. Every three months, every six months, you should meet. Reflect over the process part of it. Okay. And rededicate to a unified family and business. For this, persistence is what, practice is what, then only you will be perfect. It's like one of my heroes, uh, Bruce Lee. He's a hero for most people who have watched him and uh, uh, entered the dragon or other uh, movies. And Bruce Lee's reflexes are so, so fast. It all came from persistence, practice, and perfection. So we need to do that. And then only we will be able to manage this kind of crisis. What's required is to respond, quick response, faster response, active response, and very effective response. Take care. I leave here with this thought, and I'll be happy to uh, discuss other points. Over to uh, Kumar. Uh, thanks, Ram. Uh, it was a great job condensing all your uh, decades of experience of, uh, you know, not only teaching, but doing research and doing consultants in family business. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, which are common, but I will restrict myself to taking these questions based on the context. There are some are very generic questions, but uh, very interesting questions from Nikhil Totuka. Uh, if the family has aligned, I think Ram, you can also see the question in the Q&A as you know. Uh, this is from Nikhil Totuka. Uh, if the family has aligned roles for family members business-wise, one son managing a sports business, other medical business. Since son one is nowadays free, understandable, there's nothing happening on a sports. He tends to interfere with the operations in medical business. Even if the suggestions are constructive, it is treated as intrusion by son too. How to manage such a situation? I think I have already uh, anticipated uh, or responded to that. Um, what I suggest is that uh, there should be mechanism to understand the role. The role clarity should be there. So if there are families involved in multiple businesses, there will be multiple possible roles using the IADA framework. Who would be taking decision and what kind of decisions? Who would be consulted and who would be informed? So if that part is very clear, the interference or non-interference can be addressed. So sometimes the, the other argument is that it's not the interference, lack of interest, lack of involvement of others. Some, some families, they say that nobody else is interested in my business. What do I do? So therefore, I would say that uh, apply the, uh, the IADE principle, and then you will be able to uh, address that. And yeah. it won't happen overnight. Sit down and see what, what are the complaints, what are the decision areas, and then find out how to move forward. It's a process. Yeah, Ram, uh, some, many, many of the participants have asked, uh, is it uh, okay for Thai Kerala to share your PPT with the participants? Of course. I don't have, an, I mean, I believe in sharing and, uh, 
as, as many people as possible. And if, uh, if it's of any benefit to anybody, I'll be the most, the happiest person. So I think Nirmal will definitely share it. Uh, thanks, Ram, for that. Uh, okay, there is uh, there's a request which makes sense. I think we can you can shut down the screen share, uh, Ram, now so that somebody has told please switch to video mode. That is interesting because they want to see the browser in a full full screen. So can you close the screen share, please, Ram? Yeah, let me. Uh, let me see. I'm still learning. So, share, stop screen share, I think. Yeah. Stop sharing. Yes. Yeah. Okay, there you are. Um, so, you will all get a copy of the presentation which uh, Tai Kerala office, uh, Nirmal Panikar will send that. Uh, uh, Abdul Basit, uh, there's a question. Very good talk, sir. Can you share an example of family having any good code of conduct so that we can build on it? Build on, yeah. He, uh, Abdul wants the name of the family or list of uh, uh, of the code of conduct. Maybe the elements of code of conduct. Maybe I don't. Know. There are there are many many families with uh, good. I mean, all of us have uh, fairly good code of conduct. The range may be high or low. Uh, that's all. Uh, but some of the the basic um, the conduct rules are uh, that uh, respect others. Respect everybody. Don't shout. Come on time. So these are minimum things. Use language very carefully. Prepare yourself before coming for the meeting. Do your homework and uh, share the information, whatever is required. And join actively any discussion. Contribute to the discussion. Contribute to the process of de developing policies and practicing. So. Yesterday, I was talking to somebody with a respected uh, family. So he, he said that it all depends how much you bring to the table. So it's everybody's responsibility to contribute. So all these things are there. So if you look at what is required to run a good board, say that if it is in the office context, if there is a board meeting, if there is a formal meeting, look up and follow some of those things. I would say that those are very important. In the family context, the major thing is that we are driven by sort of equality, birthright kind of uh, principles. We think that we can do whatever we want. And that will be destructive. So remember that that is required. Everyone has to contribute. And for this, let me do the best thing possible. So some of the things I mentioned, if you look up, you will find a lot more uh, on the code of conduct from the net. Ram, very interesting question. I am also keen to get the answer from you. Uh, an anonymous attendee, do you think the lockdown is the right time to hand over the reins of business to the next generation? It depends how you define handing over. Okay. Handing over is a, a it's not an event. It's a process. And I believe that it requires a lot of preparedness and that preparedness depends on the scenarios. What, what is the, the future scenario? So, I mean, my best example is sort of a relay race. Who should be the first runner? Who should be the last runner? Who should be running in between? So we should be clear as to what kind of competition is there? What kind of environment is there? What kind of technology influences there? What kind of... Uh, awareness about the environment is required. If we are very clear about it, then decide that the handing over could mean 100% to 1% or less. Okay, It could be operational involvement. It could be including operation and strategy. It could be operation, strategy, and ownership. So I would say that I don't believe that handing over lock, stock, and barrel to somebody is the right solution. It is important for family members to come together, decide the decision-making process, who is going to drive the decision-making, who is going to implement it, and who are all going to be involved in the implementation. And again, don't leave it there. Review that regularly. Because it's more like daily exercise, daily flexible. I mean, body should be flexible. Unless we prepare for that, it will not be possible. So therefore, 
see that this is the kind of scenario building up. These are the capabilities required for the leader and therefore decide what kind of capabilities the next generation member have and also what kind of capabilities are required. And I don't think that the senior generation is useless in that context. So they have their own best. So bring a process clarity in that. Brilliant answer, Ram, because uh, I will share a quick experience, take a minute. One of my family business clients told uh, Kumar, this is the right time to, he's about 53, 54. And he has already answered the question, what next? I mean, he wants to, uh, you know, leave his operational responsibilities. So his son is 24. So he told me, Kumar, this is the right time to hand it over to my son. Basically because things are going so bad in this crisis. Even if my son takes over, he will learn the tricks of the trade very fast. <laughs> but I think I advise him in a different way, but your advice sounds much better in terms of, uh, you know, going through various aspects of handing over. What is handing over in the first place? Let uh, me add one more thing, Kumar. Yeah. I mean, in a lighter vein, I'm very sure that things are going to collapse and I can blame him. <laughs> so, so <he's> <laughs> but this family business owner, he is successful. He's doing well. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is that, no, no, I, I, therefore, I, I, I think that don't do doing any jerky <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, there is one question from Raman Nanda. Uh, can you share the names of role model families in India in terms of good governance? Oh, there are quite a few. There are quite a few, I mean, if you look up families that have stood together across generations, are happily united, built together. So there are quite a few big and uh, small, large families. Uh, some of the large families, uh, family businesses in India, and one of my best pick is the Murugappa group uh, from Chennai. They're the fifth generation. They have uh, 30 plus uh, more than that uh, family members, very strong governance mechanism, very strong traditions, highly ethical, one of the most ethical families uh, you can ever think of. So uh, then there are others like, I mean, for instance, yet another family that has stood together, worked together, built together is the Godridge group, uh, yet slightly smaller, but very well uh, governed very highly professionalizes the Dabur group again, fifth generation. Uh, the Tata group is a family controlled, but it is not conventional family business. So there are many, many families, but they have developed their own governance mechanisms. So, and then if you look around, you will find that there are families uh, in our own surroundings also, the smaller family businesses. And there are many families working on building the governance mechanism. Productivity. And the reason is that in most of, uh, because uh, the Indians, uh, uh, our industrial history is uh, short, uh, most of them are in the third generation, fourth generation uh, stage. And there are many families working on building governance proactively instead of assuming that governance is there, and instead of assuming that relationship is given. This is the basic argument that I'm bringing in my. Uh, gridlock phenomenon discussion. I've developed this uh, called the gridlock phenomenon. Family businesses get into a gridlock over a period of time without their own realization. And if you look at some of these families that have stood together, grew together over generation, you'll find that they have anticipated challenges of working together, keep the business responsibility separate from the family responsibilities, or the family role is different from the business role. So families that are very clear that, for instance, involvement in the business is based on merit. Decision-making is based on merit. Decision-making reward systems are based on what is good for the business. Whereas if you look at the families, the relationship is very important. Love, affection, harmony are important. Harmony doesn't mean that everyone has to be part in the business equally. And they can do the, I mean, they, they will be, all of them are equally capable. So families that have good governance are very clear about the role of the family in the family context, as well as the business context. So if you have a family business, start working at it. Write, read about families that have stood together, built together. Plenty of materials are available. 
Ms. Kumar. Yeah, uh, Ram, I think we are in a little bit of trouble. I know you have a hard close by 6.15, 6.20, as you told. Uh, there are plenty of questions, but I have to... I will be shorter. We'll, we'll make it... Uh, I'll, I'll pick and choose some of the questions which are very relevant and contextual hmm. for today's discussion. Here is one, must be an young guy, uh, Abbas Harris. Uh, I had a plan of doing MBA and then take care of my father's business. But right now, spending huge money for education and then take charge of the business is advisable. <laughs> I'm putting all difficult questions to you, Ra. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. I, I'm very, very clear. I'm very clear. What is the value addition you are expecting from doing an MBA? I think one should be very clear about if I do an MBA, this is what the value addition beyond the certificate, beyond the brand value. Is it for knowledge? Is it for skill? Is it for building up capabilities? Is it for also building up network? or whatever it is. And then decide what kind of program you have to do, whether you want to do a two years program, one year program, or multiple programs over a period of time or not. But then you can do, for instance, we have what's called a MFAB program, which is a modular program. Or whether you think that, well, this is all pricey, very expensive, let me not do any of those things, let me start learning on my own, let me go for short duration programs at different paces, one week, two weeks, or one month, two months program, and then learn. So I think the, uh, we should be very clear about the goal, what we want to achieve from that, and then decide what kind of programs are. I mean, nobody, there are very, very successful people who have done MBA, uh, like uh, Kumar, and there are many people who haven't done MBA, but still very successful. Okay, so choose what is good for you in your context. And one of the basic principles I always tell people is that strategy is context specific. Resource building is context specific. Do what is appropriate for you. Kumar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is one question from Dhruv Arora uh, for a family member who has joined business sometime back compared to other sibling who has been in business for more than a decade, is it fair to bring equal demarcation roles when there will be a big, big difference in experience and understanding? Can you share insights on family working as a team so no competitiveness should come specifically in times of crisis? So different uh, capability, competency metrics among family members, how do we sort of manage it? Yeah, I think there should be, this is the best time to take stock of the competences. And that's what I say. Uh, one of the slides I had mentioned that uh, look at the resource basket you have. Some people may have very high skills. Some people may have a lot of knowledge. So skills also may be in terms of analysis, skills may be in terms of communication, skills may be in terms of negotiation or decision making or whatever it is. So make a, an inventory of all these uh, skill baskets and then see who is best to take a decision? I remember in one, uh, one of the family businesses where the eldest brother said that I'm not the right peer person to lead the business. And he allowed the younger brother to run the business. And also when the business is growing, like the relay race, when the business is growing to when it is facing tough times, the skill set may be different. So if you have multiple skills, sit down, make an inventory of it, and then see who are the right people for what kind of roles. And especially now, the scenario is changing rapidly. The skill set required will be different at different points in time. I think you have to build that flexibility. It should not get into anybody's head that I'm the decision maker. It should be feeling that we are all contributing to the process of decision making. And we are, it's more like a game, let's say football. It's not the, the Ronaldo or Messi who is scoring. Everyone is contributing. If Messi is scoring, the ball reaches him because of the work of many others. So it's a team effort. I think that conviction, realization will be required. That's a question from Alexander Nero. Uh, everybody always feels that they have contributed to the organization. How does one look at, look at this performance when different business of different sizes and investments? How does one evaluate performance in this situation? I hope Alexander is referring to the family member uh, or from the family itself running the business. So 
again coming to the evaluation criteria around. Yeah, that, it, it's not an easy uh, solution I can uh, recommend. Uh, the reason is that different businesses are in different stages of their life cycle. Different businesses face different kinds of challenges. Somebody who is the best may be running a loss making company or the industry may be growing beyond limits. And even if that individual is not so good, the results may be phenomenal. So therefore, don't go by the turnover as the, or the profit as the single criterion or criteria for deciding the performance. I think it is important to decide again, across the table, decide that these are the challenges faced by this company and the performance will be decided based on this. So there are a lot of uh, HR related tools available for evaluation, performance evaluation mechanism. So I would recommend families to take it to take the help of HR professional, HR uh, uh, practices, so that a lot of the things that you apply in the business context can be applied for evaluation of the performance of family members who are involved in the business. Yeah, here is a question from Narayan Kumar. Uh, can you give some examples of good family governance in Kerala? Would like to know that most of the family run business, cashew, choir, seafood, are all showing downward trend? I, I think there are two parts. Uh, one is that uh, the performance of the business doesn't have anything to do with family governance or is not the single variable uh, influenced by the uh, business family governance or the family governance is not the only reason why some of the industries are going down. Okay, so I know of some of the families which are doing very well, but the, uh, in governance wise, but the industry is not in great shape. And, but at the same time, there are family industries or the businesses, in industries which are growing very well, but they are not able to have great family governance practices. So I would, I would say that, uh, more than any of the, uh, the, the what is it, the, the industries, uh, it is important to decide how the family governance practices are uh, uh, followed. I mean, one of uh, the, 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 I mean, uh, the examples is uh, John K. Paul, who is also around uh, from the, the, uh, the popular automobiles. So they have a very good governance mechanism. They are into third generation. Uh, coming in, they have developed the policies, practices, and uh, they are building the family business, building the family relationship together with their governance. So there are very much other families which are working on it or who have worked, who have developed family governance mechanisms. Very interesting question, Ram, from Abhinandan Chopra. A real life situation looks like one brother shifted to Tripura for business expansion but due to slowdown, the other brother in Delhi turned conservative. Delhi brother wanted profitability and worked with good companies and Tribura brother, brother wanted work at all cost. How to resolve this? I think there is a need for goal alignment. It's important to have a discussion on the, what do they want to achieve in the immediate future, near term or slightly longer term, maybe in the first next five years or 10 years. I would say that uh, if the two brothers sit down, they may be able to so resolve it. Otherwise, they may like to get the uh, involvement of some outside uh, facilitator who can help them uh, align in terms of the, uh, the goals. The reason is that these are not uh, watertight compartments. So the growth could be, there are different shades. Risk, there are different shades. So there, it, it's a lot of facing possibilities are there. So profitability, yes, profitability, is it 20% profitability, 10% profitability, in between profitability, tomorrow's profitability, medium term, long term profitability. So I, I would say that it needs to be drilled further down to get into the details and the help of a facilitator will be very, very uh, useful. Ketan Kampata, I mean, this I have gone through in my family business advisory practice. He asked a question, Ram. Is it a good idea to have KPI for family members too, who are involved at the board level or at the CXO level? Hi, Ketan. Uh, yes, Hi. I believe, I believe uh, we should get down to uh, KRA to KPIs. 
The reason is that family members assume many things. Family members believe that they are contributing. So in order to ensure that uh, there is clarity, especially when the business uh, family uh, situation gets into more complex, and there are multiple family members involved in the business. And also many family members may not know what the other people are doing. And there may not be any clarity about the roles. Clarity about the role is there, but what are the indicators? Performance indicators, it is very useful, but don't be too harsh about some of these things. See that KPIs are indicative, and if developmental inputs are required for some other people, provide for that. I think that's what is required. Because some other people may be very pre well prepared to perform very well against one indicator but some other people may not be. So either take them to the training program or discussion mode or something like that, support, facilitate. I think that's an approach required. Uh, there's a question from Varnugopal MB. Is it possi possible to give a legal backing to a family, family arrangement agreement? Uh, some parts of it, yes. Some yeah, parts yeah. of it, particularly the ownership part of it. Uh, I would say that most families uh, go for either a shareholders agreement or a, if it is a trust, then there is a trust deed. So that part is uh, legally enforceable. But a lot of the other uh, agreements, agree, uh, understanding, uh, is more or less what we call the gentleman's agreement. But also the reason is that uh, uh, I, I don't believe that going to, through the legal process is the solution. Given that our uh, courts are uh, filled up with uh, cases for the next 30, 40 years, so even if you have a legal agreement, uh, enforcing that is not going to be easy, especially civil cases. So you have to have that primarily for clarity, primarily for accountability, but uh, in, uh, a lot of it depends on your own willingness to practice that. So have the agreement, we revisit it, and make sure that people are respectful of the agreement and then start practice. But yes, shareholders agreement, trust deed are two parts, or the ownership related documents are legally enforced. Yeah, this is again related to, uh, you know, the cross-generational stuff. Uh, it is from Fadil Kareem. Uh, we are doing a family retail business. Firstly, I and my father, Manage was managed and was having good business. Now my younger brother is managing the business. He is not at all interested we to interfere in that business now. My father is now old and he is not used to come to shop and I am in wholesale lane. I think it looks like there are two lines of business, uh, wholesale and retail. Uh, so there is, I think so again come to your IAD. Uh, IAD and uh, family level discussion maybe as, uh, it, it would be useful to get uh, involvement of some uh, advisor like uh, Kumar or anybody like that, uh, who will be able to provide. I mean, I think sometimes uh, handholding is important. Uh, so that kind of expertise may not be there. The process capabilities family members may not have. So it is very important to have that, uh, at least in the initial stages, early days. And later, it may be possible for uh, family members to handle on their I think I understand from Nirmal that there's some uh, somebody has raised a hand. Uh, we can allow. Who is that, Nirmal? Uh, can you allow? I, I can't allow the hand ra hand raising here. You may have to allow it, Nirmal, as the administrator here. Nirmal, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, we have Samir Agarwal. You had a question, I think. Uh, Samir, can you go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, please. Let me ask the question here. We have time. We have another 15 minutes. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me, sir? Hi, Samir. Hi, sir. Uh, so, sir, the uh, question, uh, my question... Can you uh, uh, speak up a little bit closer to the mic? Uh, can you hear me better, sir? Yes. Thank you so much. So, sir, my question was that, uh, so uh, both our generations, uh, me, my dad, uh, my uncle, all of us are attending your session right now. So, uh, we were wondering that we have 10 days ahead of us and... Uh, we have tried some ways to, you know, uh, start the discussions regarding family management, family business uh, planning a bit, but we haven't been too successful. 
so we were wondering if you can give us like some points that uh, how to start about and how what requirements to be looked into before uh, getting into it you you said that you have tried and uh, things are not moving yeah generally we have the dining table meeting uh, as <laughs> you uh, firstly <laughs> said not to do yeah right um i i would say that uh, if you get there are two ways of uh, approaching if you have looked at my book 10 uh, commandments uh, there is a diagnostic questionnaire given at the end of it uh, one of the chapters so that uh, diagnostic questionnaire if uh, all of you can uh, look at it fill it up and then identify some of the areas which is actually uh, based on the criticality discontent uh, framework uh, that helps you to identify some of the critical areas where a lot of dissatisfaction is there so if uh, if all of you are open to the idea of uh, scoring and then such identifying key areas of concerns and i would say that identify those so that is one way of looking at and then start finding out what solutions are possible for that is one the second thing is that look at that identify each person can identify list down three areas three major areas of concerns three just a number three or five areas of concerns okay and then somebody can compile this and then if you have to have the openness to discuss take one by one and then discuss why these are important what are the key challenges we are facing my approach is that try to find solutions to immediate uh, challenges uh, very often these are all not very fundamental issues a lot of the process issues are there it may be about discipline it may be about attitude it may be about uh, 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 the behavior it may be about uh, maybe respecting others code of conduct and then also i did uh, develop sort of a at least five six key points of uh, code of conduct to start with i would say these are some of the things you can do and in my book i have also mentioned uh, uh, how to go about writing the constitution there are some tips but uh, given that uh, the, i mean unless you have a copy of it uh, it's not uh, easy to get a uh, copy of it now with the lockdown around but i would start saying that without going for the questionnaire or anything each one of you can write down three to five areas of concern areas of importance that you need to address sooner than later and then develop some sort of a at least interim solutions discuss the fundamental reason why these are there and then develop some sort of alternatives discuss it arrive at and then start practice slowly i think that will work normal is there anybody else who has raised yeah that? yeah the next question is from rekha prakash jain yeah uh good evening sir uh, i want to know uh, that uh, our old staff very old staff and the new generation the next generation which is joining the business how to make a balance between them because the both the policies are totally different uh the old staff uh, things that they know everything and uh, they are the right thing and they have worked with their actually parents and all like that and new generation they have studied well and their thinking is different uh they are uh, all uh, together is different so how to actually make a coordination i am facing this practical this problem in my organization so and rekha uh, you are not the only one <laughs> yeah <laughs> most of the younger generation members i have spoken to have the same same or similar kind of issues my senior generation family members uh do not side with me they uh they are uh, close to the loyal employees so there is sort of a, a dilemma between loyalty versus uh the uh, the, uh, the quality of decision the capabilities okay my my approaches are uh, multi pronged one is that start uh, applying objective decision making okay so very often the uh, whether it is old or new 
the right decision is is not based on objective analysis so again apply the principle of uh, options evaluation of it what is appropriate for the given context i'll give you an example one of the uh, companies i had worked with uh, in the uh, spices business so they had uh, uh, old guards and there was a new production uh, head appointed so he came with um, a lot of new knowledge and all and uh, uh, the, the the spice uh, the output of our product was not uh, uh, giving the same features the quality was different and then the the production person who was the the senior person who have, was with the company for about 20 30 years he said that it is because the raw material is bad and he pushed the blame to the purchase person and the supplier okay but the new production person said that uh, that may be but let's not accept that let's look at it why this happened how can this happen so he said that under what conditions the output quality can come down then he sat down with the other person they found out that it could be one reason could be the raw material quality the second could be the the machine is not set properly If the machine is not set properly the temperature will not be the right one and if you are putting the spice uh, raw material through that by the time it comes out there is a temperature difference and they really found out that it was not because of the raw material problem but because the machine was not set properly or the machine was not running properly and i would say that start applying this principle if you are facing this problem the younger generation members have a responsibility to build professionalism professionalism means objective decision making whether the person is old or new it doesn't matter bring professionalism then accountability then set targets and i would say that if that kind of an approach is there then you would find that some of the older people are very good they can learn they can move forward some of the others may not be great but then how to take care of them some of the others may not be possible to move on so how do you take care of them give them retirement benefits or some vrs kind of schemes or something like that because the old god has stood with you for long during the times of build up hardship okay so i won't say that it is uh, it, it's not a zero one kind of game it's a process there is one question ram from a hospital person chirak sankeshwari sir how do we manage hospitals as family business as non doctor as a non doctor uh, maybe the ceo of the hospital and manage doctors and nursing staff as most of the doctors think to work either in big hospitals or start their private practices yeah so this is uh, from a hospital uh, apollo hospital group other than dr pratap reddy there is no family member who is a medical doctor all his three children they are all daughters they are all involved in the business they are all running a ceo level responsibilities and you know that apollo has been very successful in terms of various hospitals or related services across the country so if you have the capabilities it's not the knowledge of surgery it's not the knowledge or the skill of uh, treating disease but understanding the business understanding the uh, the profession understanding the skills required and responding to that i think that's what is required so if you read up on that you find that there are several family business uh, family controlled hospitals even without being a medical doctor medical degree helps but i won't say that that is that should be taken as a disadvantage find out in the whole process of managing in a hospital it's only one part where the skill of the doctor is important rest of it is in management so it is possible so probably attending some programs on hospital management will be very good yeah, about apollo i remember uh, i attended one of the isb seminars and i think sankita uh, yeah our panelist and i remember she telling it's a it's a it's a code of conduct in the family that no business will be discussed on the dining table since you told about apollo 
Yeah, right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. It matters, so it's not that is. Okay, here is one, uh, maybe last two, three questions we can take, uh, looking at the time. Uh, family members in same business, especially brothers, should compensation be different? So compensation should be dependent on capability, experience and commitment to the business. Or can every member expect the same compensation? One brother may be very hardworking and other takes life easy. I, I would say that accountability is very important. I mean, it used to be um, all sharing the equal wealth. The reward system should be equal. Uh, the compensation should be equal. I think that we are moving closer to a situation where there is respect for the capabilities, respect for the contribution. But it should not be a blind set of guidelines. It should be more objective. It should be discussed between the brothers or within the family about the criteria you're going to apply. Reward system doesn't mean it's just only the salary. There are perks. And again, the salary that can be a fixed component and the variable component. And the variable component is more to acknowledge the contribution rather than to uh, give incentives. It can be for incentives, it need not be. But I would say that it is important to recognize that the reward system need not be uh, the same across all family members, especially when there are uh, patients. I recently, uh, I mean, I remember a uh, family business in North India, uh, whom I have known for over 30 years. The, they had attended my program while I was in IAM as well as in ISB. So there was a, uh, the, there are two cousins. One is very capable, very committed, very uh, hardworking. The other is not so much. And I try, I told them that unless there is understanding, appreciation for the differences, things may fall apart. And finally, they had to uh, go for the sale of the company. The company is sold to an overseas company. And the hardworking uh, cousin has been appointed as the CEO. So it may, it, it is important to avoid such situations. Therefore, it is important to have clarity about the reward system. Don't blindly accept that we will have complete differences or there is no difference. I think the days of, of the joint family where everything is the same, everybody living under one roof and that there is no compensation. Earlier there was no concept of compensation. It was only withdrawal according to family is required. So those situations have changed. So we have to appreciate that, recognize that, and then decide what kind of uh, compensation structure is required take advantage of the help of uh, HR professionals. I think there are a lot of questions on conflict resolution. I will pass it, Trump, for the time being because uh, it's not it possible. Is, uh, yeah. It's in the scheme of things for uh, Tiny Kerala to bring in a family business advisor who is an expert in conflict resolution. So I will pass those questions and uh, uh, an anonymous attendee must be, I take this, uh, okay. Uh, all of us from Sunny Malayal. Okay, before that, there is a question which I would keep the questioner as anonymous, though he has told his name. His grandfather is too much interfering in his business. What should I do? <laughs> I thought this grandson and grandfather should not be in the same webinar, and he'll create problems. So I'm keeping him anonymous. So he has asked. Sure, 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 sure. This is uh, this is not uncommon. This is fairly <laughs> common, and uh, interference uh, ranges. Interference ranges uh, from uh, very limited interference to 100% micromanagement. Okay, so there are multiple approaches possible, and I don't say that there is one injection which will work. Uh, I, I think the, uh, it's important for the family to have a workshop, take, uh, uh, I, I call this a success. Uh, encourage the grandfather to go for some either conference, talk, or uh, meetings with the family on family business and uh, that person should understand should be able to expose to the new realities that family businesses uh, need to be managed more professionally the involvement of all family members uh, will be different it is changing so i would say that 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 is one attend some of this program invite a family business expert to have a workshop for the family members or friends of the family have somebody to talk to the grandfather whom he respects so that the interference can come down 
or somebody to talk to him and understand why he is interfering. There are various reasons. Very often it is lack of information. The children don't keep them informed. There is anxiety, whether things are all right or wrong. I slog for 50 years to build the business. Now I don't even know. So I apply the IADE principle. And very often the grandfather will say that I'm okay. So you take care of things, but keep me informed. So I think that multiple approaches are possible. So uh, don't give up. Talk to the person. To, uh, discuss maybe to start with. Discuss with the grandfather as to what kind of information he wants. Why does he want to interfere? Does he think that he knows it better or not? So have some co communication with that person if possible. Otherwise, get some outside help to facilitate. Uh, I think we will close this now, Ram, because uh, I know uh, Ram takes uh, four-day seminars in Indian School of Business, which I have attended. He conducts one-day programs. Uh, he talks for one hour. So, so all the students <laughs> which has come here are very relevant. Some of them we will take it up in our subsequent webinars. So before I hand over to uh, Nirmal uh, to do the rest, uh, one comment from my successor, Ram, uh, it's Ajit Mopan, who is the current president of Thai Kerala. I just read out his message. I must say, there's a comment for Professor Ram. Delighted to listen to you, sir. Very informative and inspiring talk. Uh, it is a record participation. I fully agree because we started with 283 participants. Uh, now, of course, uh, as we say always, one hour beyond webinar. Even now, there are 179 participants uh, still listening to us. So it's a brilliant uh, participation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Look forward to associating more with you in future. This is from Ajit Mopan, our president. Uh, I, I mean, I really. Thank you very much for your kind words. So let me hand over. Uh, so there are a lot of questions again coming, super sessions and all that. So before I hand over, Ram, a personal thanks to you. It's been a brilliant uh, session. So over to Narman. My pleasure. Before we wind up, a uh, request uh, past President John K. Paul to uh, conclude and uh, provide a vote of thanks. John has to, Johnny has to unmute the... Uh, unmute. Yeah. Both. Mic and the video. Video also, Johnny? Yeah, but I think uh, they have blocked it. I do not mean. <laughs> this is not fair, Nirmal. Please, I want to see Johnny. <laughs> Are you? I'll try it again. Yeah. It's blocked from there. Uh, okay. so you, you start and I don't okay. think um, Go ahead, it doesn't matter. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. No, no. I think it was a really a wonderful session. I mean, uh, we've been associated for almost 12 years now. Okay, I don't know the, if anybody in Kerala, any group in Kerala has been associated with you for so long. And I know the advantages of having gone through uh, being advised slowly. We took, uh, I would like to tell all the participants that it took us almost uh, four years before we actually started writing our, uh, what do you call it, constitution. Okay. And that has helped, but he didn't stop there. He, he continued and uh, now and then we keep meeting up. He comes uh, once in a while, once in six months, it was used to be three months, four months, then it became six months and now it's uh, within the last one or two years. So once in a while we keep meeting up and it, it is not just a meet. Again, he comes up with lots of new ideas and uh, we actually pick up many of those ideas because as we go on. And I have to all the participants, what I would like to say with my experience is that, I mean, my experience is not uh, too much, but uh, I've been in the hit trade for last 40, 45, almost 44, 45 years. Okay. So I think uh, that should be a fairly good experience. And what uh, has happened to us in the last 10 years is a hell of a lot. In the sense, uh, the... The camaraderie between all of us, all the directors, uh, the understanding with our children on our way forward has all been sort of, uh, you know, advised and brought in shape with Ram's advice. And instead of trying your own family coaching or family decisions, I would say it's best to pick up or try and get an advisor from outside. 
because that will be easier than trying to uh, push around your family members or trying to make them understand by with your advice or somebody's advice. But if it's an outsider, such advice would be accepted much easier and they would be more pragmatic. They wouldn't have any relationship with one director or the other. So they will have give you a far more balanced uh, opinion and it will be acceptable to more more number of people, whether they are senior or junior. Okay. And uh, I've seen this thing going on. It's within our family. I've also seen, uh, as he had, uh, Ram had mentioned, uh, the Murgapa group, uh, the present chairman is a classmate of mine and a very good friend of ours. And I know how well they, the Murgapa group, manages their thing. Uh, quite often, we, we take his advice. He used to be on our uh, advisory thing. I mean, he used to also come and give us some advice on how to uh, run the family business. And that has helped. That has helped a lot. So we have, as we have grown, we have, uh, both my brother and I have moved out of the business on time. We had a target set for our age. And when we reached that age, we just moved out. Okay. I think uh, all this has helped the group strengthen and look forward. So uh, once again, I don't want to waste your time. All of you come, had come to listen to Ram. And I'd like to thank Ram a lot on behalf of Thai Kerala. Thank you. And also, uh, Mr. Deepak from IFL, I would like to extend our thank you to you too for uh, being with us for Thai K and helping us move forward. And, you know, especially in these lockdown days to have webinars. That's the only thing we can all listen to, uh, at least for professionally, you know, uh, growing, uh, growing professionally. So, I mean, uh, what else can we do? We can watch movies or hear, listen to music. But this, you know, always incites our minds and starts making us think differently. So thank you once again. Thanks, everybody. There are, you know, MSA just said there were about 200 and 83 participants at the maximum. And I think that's hell of a lot, especially Taike has just started. It's only in the lockdown period that we started with our webinars. And uh, to have reached this sort of a participation is uh, tremendous. Uh, it's due to the work of um, Ajit and MSA and all the Thai management group. Uh, thank you very much. And I congratulate all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, before, before we conclude, uh, one quick announcement. Uh... There's going to be another interesting webinar coming up next Monday uh, from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. This is by Mr. Boman Moradian, uh, who is a adjunct faculty, is a practicing manager as well uh, from Bajaj Institute of Management Studies as well as SPJ in School of Global Management. He's going to talk on theory of constraints for internal application in manufacturing and service organizations. Let me vouch for one thing, uh, whomever we are picking up, uh, I mean, as you have seen from many webinars, uh, this is the best mind on manufacturing and operations. I have attended two or three classes of his uh, in, in family business related matters as well as in manufacturing. So please do join us at 10.30 a.m. on Monday, 27th April. Some people have asked whether we will be sharing the recording. Uh, we'll be more than happy to share since uh, Ram is uh, more than willing to share uh, his experience. So we will be sharing. Uh, we have recorded it. Uh, so we'll be sharing that. So uh, once again, uh, thanks to all participants. Uh, it was a brilliant session. Thanks, Ram, once again on behalf of Thai. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, we conclude today's uh, session. As MSA mentioned, we have another uh, lineup of uh, very interesting sessions next week. Uh, these will be mailed to you in subsequent days. Uh, thank you again for joining. The slides and the, uh, the video recordings will be shared with you all very uh, quick, very soon. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. Understand the minutes, stand